I am really excited to be here, not so much because I get to present some science that I'm very excited about, but I'm just really enthusiastic to see so many great people here who are interested in science. And I'm going to try not to let you down. And so the key, I think, as this talk proceeds is if you have a question, stop me, right? If you don't understand something, stop me. I'll try to explain it. I wanted to show you a little bit of data today uh, to give you a sense of how us as scientists discover new things to try to sort of reach, in this case, reach back in time, reach way back in time to try to understand where biology even came from. Now, I, I was uh, told that I should maybe uh, do a little bit of introduction of myself um, to tell you where this biological entity came from. Uh, and so I'll do that first and then give, uh, give you an overview of the kind of science that we're doing. So uh, um, as Dr. Zell mentioned, I was a student at the University of Wisconsin actually grew up in a very tiny town. Well, actually about eight miles outside of a very tiny town in the middle of Wisconsin. And like many other people from my home state, I grew up on a dairy farm. And in fact, I, 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 up until just a few years ago, I could say that I milked cows for more years than I was doing science. Okay, so if you, wanna, if you want me to tell you how to milk a cow, I'd be happy to chat with you after, after the talk. But I think it was, it was that experience on the farm and being surrounded by biology and having a bit of curiosity about exploring uh, sort of unexplored uh, territory which made me become a scientist. And I think, I think one of the formative uh, points in my life was finding, uh, we had, a, we had a, a globe, a globe of the earth uh, at home and it was a very old globe. And I looked at this globe thinking, wow, I want to be an explorer. I want to explore parts of the globe that haven't been explored before. And I was really disappointed to find that even on this very old globe, there was only a little tiny part of that globe that, that had printed on it unexplored territory. Right? The entire globe had largely been explored. By the way, that unexplored territory was at the North Pole. Right? So I don't know if I was going to go there. But it is very clear that there is a huge amount of unexplored territory. And in biological sciences, much of it tends to be very, very small, very tiny. In fact, we tend to work with a lot of molecules, some of them that we find in biology, including we find in human cells, and others that we can create by doing, uh, doing experiments in the test tube. Uh, basically, we can even evolve molecules in the test tube to do things that perhaps uh, are not uh, present in nature. All right, so we have uh, enough insight into biology to be able to manipulate biology. But what I think we all would like to have as scientists is a very clear sort of instruction list, a, a parts list of all the biological parts so that we can figure out really how machines as complicated as humans work. And that's maybe the quest of a lot of people uh, who are doing science in, in, in the biological sciences at Yale. We want that parts list. We want to understand what those parts do. We want to understand them when they go wrong. And we want to fix them if they do go wrong. All right, now, I'm not going to talk about modern medicine as, as, as uh, uh, much as one might think. I'm going to have just a little bit of information on how the science we do relates to medicine. But I want to tell you about a time on the planet that we call the RNA world. Right, this was a time before there was DNA and before there were proteins. There's a very good um, um, uh, uh, collection of data that says that biology came from RNA, that at one time RNA molecules ruled the planet. And eventually those things evolved to give rise to what we have today. So in order to introduce this story, I've got to tell you what RNA molecules are. All right, so what is RNA? Well, some of you, oh, you know, here, go ahead. Oh, I don't even know why I need slides here today. This is exactly right. So what you've described, here is, here is DNA. Sorry, here is DNA. Let me see if I can get myself a laser pointer here. This is DNA. Many of you know that DNA is a long molecule and it's double-stranded. So the two strands wrap around each other. Right? Each human cell has about this much DNA in it. 
Every one of your cells, you can't see your, your cells, each one is so small, but it has a molecule or set of molecules that together stretch about the length of my arms, all wrapped up, double-stranded, and stuffed into each cell. And each one of those DNA molecules codes for the entire instruction list that tells your cells how to operate. Most of that DNA codes for proteins. All right? Proteins are like the action molecules of the cell. DNA stores that information. So what is this RNA stuff? All right, so RNA is one strand, typically one strand, and the, the, the budding scientists in the audience noted that there's a difference between RNA and DNA. And one of them is the, the base here. So in this case, this chemistry is slightly different than this chemistry. The one on the left called U or uracil is a bit different than thymine, uh, which is uh, labeled T here. All right? Otherwise, RNA and DNA both have four bases, and that's that big ring structures, the, the ring structures that are shown here. Right, these are the rings. And I have a little molecular model that shows one, what we call a nucleus in the RNA or DNA chain. Right, and so here is that ring structure. And in the center is a little uh, molecule we call ribose if it's RNA. It's that little five, little pentagon structure in the center. We call that ribose in RNA. And then there's a third part, which is phosphate. Okay, so this little molecule is one of these units in the DNA or RNA chain. Now there are billions of these in DNA, in every one of your cells. Right, so if, if DNA, if, if a, a link in that chain were this big, the DNA molecule in every one of your cells would stretch to about the coast of China, right, about halfway around the, around the Earth. Of course, these molecules are very small, we can stuff them in these tiny cells that you can't see. RNA molecules are very similar, but there's one major difference other than that U versus T. So again, don't worry too much about the details here. This is just a bunch of letters indicating the different atoms in the, in the chain that is DNA or, or RNA. RNA has an oxygen here on this, this little five-membered ring, and DNA is lacking that oxygen, right? So we call this ribose, and since there's a missing oxygen, we call it deoxy, or it's missing oxygen ribose, deoxy ribose, ribose. So that's where the DNA, the term DNA comes from, is missing that oxygen. And it's missing that oxygen on every sugar. Now, I'll, I'll tell you why biology uses DNA to store our information. Because that DNA molecule and its missing oxygen are almost a million times more stable Right, so if you're going to store information, right, if you're going to keep information, you want to keep it for a long time, you want that molecule to be very stable. RNA falls apart very quickly, you know, again, about a million times faster, all, all, uh, only because of that oxygen. All right, so we store information with DNA. That DNA codes for information that makes proteins. But what is puzzling about modern cells is that they use RNA as a go-between, right? So they, they have DNA, but they make RNA temporarily, and then that RNA tells the cell which proteins to make. So that's a very odd arrangement. It's not clear, at least initially, it wasn't clear why biology has that RNA right in the middle between the two other important molecules of the cell. All right, so let's look at this, because I'm gonna tell you that that RNA molecule, or these RNA molecules, began life, or uh, life passed through a phase where everything was run by RNA. You stored your information with RNA, and you did, you, you, you did chemistry. You acted uh, in the cell with, with RNA structures. Um, and so I have to, if I'm going to tell you uh, that RNA started life molecule early on in life, I've got to give you a definition of life. The problem is, you could ask famous biologists, what's the definition of life? And you'll probably get 10 different answers. Well, that's kind of embarrassing, right? I mean, here we are, professional biologists, and we don't even have a good defini definition for life. So I'm going to try. I'm going I'm to show you my favorite definition of, of life. So we need, we need chemistry here that is capable of replication and evolution. Basically, it says you're going to be able to reproduce or the biological uh, organism can make babies, right? It's as simple as that. And over time, 
the, the genetic information that's passed on can change or the organism can evolve over time. So it's got, an organism has to be capable of reproduction and evolution. Now, but I want you guys to think about this. All of you, think carefully about this. You can imagine some really interesting gray areas where something you say, okay, that's clearly alive. Right? You see a fuzzy bunny rabbit bouncing around. Okay, that's alive. But there are other things that act like life in some way. And I want you to ask whether that might be alive or not. All right, so here's an example. So can you imagine, I see some people shaking, no way, they're not alive. But what would happen if a spaceship landed outside and out came some robots that began to pick up cars, you know, melt down the metal, and make more robots? And pretty soon we were getting in the way and they decided that they wanted to get rid of us. I mean, I don't know, do you call that a robot? Do you call that a, a, a metal life form? All right, so I, I think that there's some interesting gray areas for you to think about. Another one, what about computer viruses? They replicate. I think most biologists would say, no, these are not alive. But you can imagine some really interesting things that might change your... All right. There are some other questions that biologists ask, but I want to ask this last one. What about an individual molecule? What about something like this? Or something like this with maybe a hundred of these links stitched together? What if that RNA molecule could fold up do chemistry, and that chemistry that it did was to make copies of itself. It would be able to make molecular babies. Right? It sometimes would make mistakes, and those molecules then could evolve. Right? That simple molecule looks nothing like what we are today, but, but fits that definition of life. All right, so let's look at something that we would clearly say is not alive. It's kind of lifelike, but it's not alive. And the one I chose here is sodium chloride. Right? That's table salt. It just has crystals of salt. You sprinkle this on your food if you want it more salty. All right, so what is it? So the chemists out there, you'll know that table salt is just sodium and chloride. And sodium ions are positive in charge. Chloride's negative, right? The two attract. And since they attract, and if you get lots of them attracting, you can have sodium molecules here actually form large crystals. And that's, you see the crystals here. All right, so let's take a look at their properties. All right, here's some, just a, a picture of some crystals of salt. We know salt crystals can grow. Because if you put crisp salt crystals in a very concentrated solution of sodium chloride, the crystals get bigger. The crystals grow. All right. They can reproduce. Because you can take a salt crystal, you could crunch it up into thousands of tiny salt crystals and put them in a high salt solution and they will grow, they'll get better. So now you have the thousand salt crystals. All right, but they can't evolve. Right? So the way I like to look at this is that if you had two planets, two new planets that you discovered, and you knew both of them had some salty ocean, and you sent two rockets up. One rocket had a bag full of salt and that rocket crashed into that, the first planet's ocean and spread salt crystals around. If you came back four billion years later and looked, you'd have a whole bunch of salt crystals, right? Nothing's really changed. But if a nut in the other rocket, you shot it up and you landed in the other salty ocean on the other planet, uh, and, that, and that rocket had molecules like this in it, RNA molecules, that could fold up and make babies, you could wait four billion years and you don't even have to go there. Those creatures that evolved out of that ocean are going to come to visit you. All right? They're going to build rockets and they're going to come to visit you. All right? So that, in a sense, is the difference between things that look like life and things that really can, can, can evolve and expand and do quite amazing things if you give them enough time. All right, now, I got to convince you of this fact here, and that is that all life forms on this planet are related. That early organism had DNA, it had RNA, and it had proteins. Why do we know that? Because all life on the planet, no matter how bizarre, no matter how distant related it is to us, have all of those components in place, suggesting that our, our ancestor 
the, 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 the ancestor that gave rise to all three uh, um, uh, of the domains of life, and I'll show you the domains of life in a moment, that they had those same components. So let's take a look at some of the things that you can uh, look at to determine that that's true. For example, all these proteins that we have, by the way, the pr these proteins, again, are the action molecules in the cells. They're doing a lot of the chemistry that we need to be alive. All those proteins, no matter what organism you are, we're using 20 of the common, the same amino acids. We all use the same 20. There is effectively an infinite number of amino acids that, you, that biology could have used, but we're only using uh, uh, the, the same 20, implying that there was an organism a long time ago that decided that 20 was the, 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 the number to use and they were going to use 20 and we have all benefited from that. We're all derived from that organism. We still use the same 20 amino acids. The instruction list to make new proteins is the same. That, that, that instruction list, that code is the same in all organisms on the planet. Um, there are coenzymes. I'm going to tell you about coenzymes and how that relates to this little bottle right here. Um, and I'm going to say that, that when, I, when I get to this, I'll stress this again, that uh, all organisms on the planet use uh, coenzymes that are identical and that we derive benefit. This is a bottle of vitamins. We derive benefit from those compounds. And I'll tell you why that's important in a moment. The last thing I want to say is the universal energy currency of all biology is ATP. Okay, so what is ATP? ATP is this molecule here, or this one here, right? This, is a, this compound here in this model is actually ATP, right? It's got that base, it's got that sugar, this little five-membered ring here, and then these three phosphates, all right? So, isn't this interesting? All biology on the planet uses that thing to store and to deliver energy in, to do almost all biological processes. And it's an RNA molecule, right? We can see it's an RNA molecule. It's got that oxygen here in this sugar. All right. So this is the universal energy currency, and it's made of RNA. And the argument here, and I'll, I'll say this again multiple times, why would biology choose an RNA molecule to store energy in all domains of life, in every life form, unless RNA came first? And it had to invent a way to store energy and all it had to work with was an RNA. All right. Now, there are other reasons why we know life is related. Um, and that is that you can look at modern uh, organisms and you can track mutations. And so you can recognize when an organism is closely related to us just by examining it physically. And then you look at the genes and it turns out that our genes are actually closely related. If you're far away, if you're uh, very distantly related, and you can tell, again, by, by f looking at the physical attributes of the organisms, uh, then you're, you have more mutations separating you. And, uh, and in a sense, you can use the number of mutations to, de de uh, de uh, to determine how distantly related an organism is. But no matter how distant they are, all of us use very similar uh, uh, components uh, to do some of the most fundamental things that a cell needs to do. And those components are shared amongst all life forms. Whether you're a human, or whether you're a plant, or whether you're a bacterium, we have some components that are identical, or shared, uh, and are very similar. All right, so, what you might be surprised by... Okay, I could have used anybody's picture here. Uh, <laughs> you'd be surprised that chimps and humans, which we know are closely related because we can tell from a physical form that we're closely related, we actually differ by only about 96% in our genes. So we're genetically almost identical to chimps. I mean, you look around the room and you may look around and say, wow, people around me look very different than I do. But you're almost genetically identical to the person sitting right next to you, okay? As you get further away, we're less similar. Now, I want to show you the family tree. Not your family tree, but our family tree. All right, so uh, here's humans. Our closest relatives are chimps and bonobos. And this, little, this is like our, our family tree. The distance, the length of these lines indicate how closely related we are. 
we shared an ancestor between humans and these two animals at this point here and then later on those organisms split um, uh, and so they're more closely related to each other because these lines are closer here. All right? Here's uh, gorillas, we're further related, right? they're more distantly related. Here's orangutans, and I'm not sure I know what that is, but it's a little bit further away <laughs> than this one. All right. So that's our, our, our close family tree. Now I'm going to impress upon you that life on the planet is amazingly diverse. There are organisms that are amazingly distant from us, and yet we share a lot of the same uh, components that make our cells run. So here are, here, this, I actually think this is one of the most amazing figures that biologists have produced. This is the, the entire tree of life, right? There are many organisms on here. Some of them you can't read because they're scientific names and, and I'm not sure I know why scientists use scientific names because no one can really figure out easily what they mean. But let me tell you, I'm going to tell you three things, or, or two things. There are three domains of life. Here are Archaeans, I'm sorry, here are eukaryotes, here are Archaeans, and here are bacteria. Now you might have heard of bacteria, right? We're eukaryotes, and then this is a domain of life uh, that was discovered not that long ago, only a couple of decades ago. They live in strange places. They typically live in the ocean or at, at, at places uh, that are uh, very high in temperature, like thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. They're very strange creatures. But it turns out that if you look at this tree, just like the, the chimp versus human tree, um, you can see that these organisms, they're sort of about halfway distance between bacteria and eukaryotes. Now, where are we on this list? We're Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens is right here. So we're at the very tip of this branch of the tree. All right, so there's people. Now, what is Zia? Anybody know what Zia is? Anybody know what Zia is? Yes. Zoo. You know what? In a sense, you're right. Okay, you hang, hang on to that idea, and it'll be clear how close you are to the right answer. Yes. It's corn. All right? On this scale of this map of life, the closest thing mapped on here is corn. Now, that doesn't mean that our closest relative is corn. It just means that there's an entire zoo of organisms that are all at this little tip. Anybody know what Caprinus is? There will be no one who will know what Caprinus is. Yes, go ahead. Mushrooms. mushrooms. These are fungi, yes. Those are mushrooms. All right, now, if you go to a zoo, okay, or you go to a botanical garden, everything that you can see with the naked eye largely is sitting right at this little tip of the tree of life. There is a massive amount of life that you would never see um, unless you were interested in biology in general, right? All the concerns that we have typically in terms of medicine are with people or our food or maybe a few things up here that infect us, right? But there's this giant tree of life. Now, there's a problem here in that there's no start to this tree. Where's the root? Okay, well, the root is hidden right here. And that's that organism, somewhere back in time. There's an organism that gave rise to all three of those domains. And it has DNA, and it has RNA, and it has proteins. But that combination is too complicated for it to have arise, uh, arisen spontaneously. All right, so how did it come about? Well, we think that there was something that was before this tree, that this tree was somehow rooted in an RNA world. This is before there were proteins and before there was DNA. Only RNA world uh, molecules and RNA world creatures. All right, now I'm going to try to convince you that that's true, but I've got to give you a, a sense of how long ago this was and how we actually discover evidence for an RNA world. All right, so let's look at some time here. The origin of life, how long ago? Well, we know from geological um, uh, data that the Earth formed about four and a half billion years ago. Okay, that's a long time ago. Uh, 
when did uh, life occur? Well, we know that there's evidence um, that there were probably complex, what we call them microbial mats. This really means slime, right? There were slime mats of, of bacteria or small single-celled organisms about three and a half billion years ago, right? So this is a, this is a hands holding what really is biological slime, little organisms that are living in a mat. Now, so, so we, don't, we don't know exactly when life began, but it had to begin somewhere after four and a half billion years ago, right? Because the planet wasn't here otherwise. Uh, or uh, significantly before three and a half billion to give rise to organisms that could live in these big communities and make these mats. So we think probably about four billion years ago. All right, so let me give you a sense of how long ago that was. All right, so here's today. Exactly as we're sitting here, this is today. And if you go back on this line, this is like going back in time. If you go back about 65 million years ago, you get to the extinction of the dinosaurs. All right, so imagine that the length of that line represented 65 million years. When did humans come on the, on the uh, scene? Well, hominids, our early ancestors, came about only just uh, several uh, million years ago. Very, very short time compared to the extinction of dinosaurs. All right, now what about the origin of life? Oh, so first of all, why do we know? How do we know this? We can, we can look at fossils, right? Actual fossils. You go to the Peabody Museum and see things like this, fossil hominids or fossil uh, dinosaurs. So we can date when those things occurred, and we know a lot about them from their fossils. Okay, so how do we get at original life? Well, turns out that molecules like this don't leave a whole lot of fossils. All right, you can't go and dig into the dirt and find fossils of the earliest RNA entities. So we got to do something different. All right, now let me give you a sense of the, the time that's elapsed to show you how really impossible this problem is. Now, in the, in the previous uh, figure, I showed you that very top line. That one line here is 65 million years. There's the extinction of dinosaurs, and, and there's today. So if you go back another 65 million, and another 65 million, and another 65 million, and another or so, you get to the point at which reptiles. You go another 120 or 150 million years, you get the emergence of land plants. So everything we know and see and love about the world and its biological diversity, we see only developing a very short time ago. If you go way back in time, a billion, two billion, three billion, about three and a half billion, you have things like these microbial mats. And then you go further back, probably another half a billion years or so to four billion, you have the origin of life. All right, so you might think that our task is impossible. How are we going to find life forms? Or how are we going to learn about life forms that have uh, emerged on the planet so long ago and that have long since been driven to extinction? Right? Modern, the modern world is dominated by organisms like us, DNA, RNA, and protein organisms. The RNA world organisms are all gone. However, I'm going to tell you that there are traces of them with us today. Because we can't see fossils in the way that you would see them at the Peabody Museum. But we can find molecular fossils. And I'm going to show you some of those things. Well, we can look for those molecular fossils in our own genes. And why is that? Well, that's because every time a biological entity reproduces, it passes on genetic information from one organism to the next. right? And then as time goes on, that organism reproduces, you pass on the genetic information. Anything in those genes that's really important for the organism to survive will be preserved. And if it was really important four billion years ago, and it's important now, you can see traces of those uh, molecules in our cells today. All right, so I'm going to show you one of the most amazing molecular fossils from a time when biology was transitioning from an all RNA world into an RNA world that also made proteins. All right, so let me, I gotta set the stage here. So again, modern cells use DNA, and they make more DNA with a protein called DNA polymerase. Simply a protein that goes out and copies DNA. All right, so when our cells divide, we have to make more DNA. That DNA codes for messenger RNAs, RNAs that take messages 
to a machine to make proteins. Right? So that RNA is made by another protein called RNA polymerase, copies DNA but converts it into RNA. And then the RNA is used to code for proteins. Right? So this is the instruction list that tells the cell what proteins to make. Ribosomes are the machines that make proteins. Okay, but what do they look like? Well, here's one of those big machines. All right? See the blue squiggles and the gray squiggles? That, those are big RNA molecules. Right? One of them, uh, well, both of them uh, together uh, are built from thousands of these nucleotides strung together in, long, in two long chains. The little purple squiggles are proteins that are kind of helping the system. Right? But if you look at the very core, it's right in the center here of this big machine that makes proteins. It's all RNA. In other words, the, mach the biological machine in all of our cells that makes proteins is an RNA machine. Right? So the, 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 the chemist that makes proteins in our cells, by the way, and, and proteins are usually the chemists. It's not a protein that makes proteins, it's an RNA that makes proteins. And so you can imagine this, why on earth would biology choose to make all the catalysts, all the, all the chemists on the planet using an RNA chemist? And this is really what's going on. You have a very special RNA that's making all these proteins that then go off and do a whole bunch of other chemistry. Unless RNA came first and RNA invented proteins. All right, so this big wonderful machine, which its structure was determined at Yale University and it won uh, uh, Tom Stites a Nobel Prize, that big machine is an RNA machine at its core. All right, so it was, it was uh, data like this, it was evidence like this that began to get scientists interested in the possibility that RNA once ruled the planet. And there was a, a, a few people I want to note that were very instrumental in telling this, or to sort of describing this to the world of, of science. One of them is a guy by the name of Carl Woese. Carl was a graduate student at Yale University. He did his training at Yale, and he went off to become a professor at the University of Illinois, and he was puzzling over how proteins are made and how the genetic code came to be. And the only way he could answer that is he said, gee, if RNA could do chemistry, if, if RNA could be a chemist, then perhaps you could imagine a very easy way in which biology could come to be. You didn't need proteins, you didn't need uh, uh, DNA, that RNA could do the chemistry. All right, so he was the first one to say this in a book titled The Genetic Code. By the way, this is a book that's hard to get now. If you find a copy, if you see that book anywhere um, at, a, at a, a bookstore or someplace where you can get it cheap, buy it because it's probably worth about $200 now. You can sell it on eBay. I might even buy it from you if you have a copy. All right? Now, there's a couple of other names I want to mention. One is Tom Check. The other is Sid Altman. So Dr. Altman is a Yale professor to this day. Right? He won the Nobel Prize along with Tom Check in 1989. Why? Because they had the first examples of RNA molecules, this is uh, RNA called RNase P, right? So this RNA goes out, finds another RNA, RNA, and cuts it. In fact, it does that cutting reaction about a billion times faster than if you just sat there and watched that RNA. It's not going to break apart, it's fairly stable. In comes RNase P, comes in, cuts that RNA about a billion times faster. And that cutting event is important to have this other RNA, the second RNA, work. So here is a very um, complex RNA structure that is able to fold up and act as a really good catalyst, chemist, in a cell. And that is important, ultimately, for cells to make proteins. Again, another bit of evidence that suggests that RNA came before proteins. All right, now, I want to tell you about some RNAs that we're finding now. And we call these things ribo switches. Ribo for ribose and switches because they're going to work as as genetic switches. They're going to turn genes on and off. And I'm going to tell you right now that these things are very common in bacterial cells and in, and, and in cells from some other organisms. Um, and they look like, they look exactly like what you would have expected RNAs to look like in an RNA world. So what is a riboswitch? Well, here's one of these messages. Right? So this is one of these long RNAs. And the black part here codes for protein. That's going to make protein. 
But in many modern cells, there's little fragments, little tails and heads of these RNAs that people thought were junk. This is just junk. Biology's accidentally put this here and it doesn't matter. Well, it turns out that in many organisms, there's not much genetic junk at all. That we just didn't know what it did. Okay, so here's an example of an RNA. So this whole thing is RNA, but it's this end that folds into one of these complex structures and it has a function. In this case, it's going to go and it's going to bind to something. It's going to grab something and it's going to turn it, uh, the production of that protein on or off. It's going to act as a genetic switch, just like a light switch. So I'm going to show you some examples. I'm going to try to give you a sense of why these things look like they crawled out of an RNA world. All right, so here, this is a little bit complicated, um, but I wanted to show you some real data. So this is a, a, a cartoon of one of these RNA molecules. So this little model, um, see there's a little letter A there. That A indicates that this molecule is at that position in the RNA chain. This, this fairly complicated molecule is at that position. And it's colored red because we, we can find many thousands of these RNAs in many different bacteria, no matter how distantly related they are, and they always have an A at that spot. All right? And that A is important for this switch to work. And you can look at all, all around here, when you see red, those are highly um, uh, constant. Right? No matter what bug you pull it from, it's got that nucleotide there. That suggests that, the, that those sequences, those uh, nucleotides at those positions are, su are super important for the RNA to function. They're important for the RNA to function today. And they were probably important four billion years ago when these RNAs were doing basically the same thing in primitive cells. All right, so that RNA binds this compound. That compound look, looks very scary. But if you take vitamin pills, you're taking, you're ingesting, you're eating that compound every time you take a vitamin pill. Right, because that compound is called uh, vitamin B12, or it's actually coenzyme B12. It's a slight derivative of vitamin uh, B12. But you take vitamin B12, your cells take it up, you convert it into this compound, and you do all sorts of chemical reactions with it in your body. It's essential. If you don't have vitamin B12, you will die. Okay? It turns out that bacteria are the same way. So are plants. So are those crazy archaeans I talked about. Everybody needs uh, uh, B12. And there's this wonderful RNA that folds into this complex shape and right in the middle of this thing is B12. So there are lots of these kinds of switches uh, in, in, in cells that will, will um, sense this compound. And they're not made of protein, they're made of RNA. Now what's interesting about this is that if you look at B12, if you look at its chemical structure, so this is the same as this one over here, but I've circled parts that look like RNA. In fact, again, that part on the top is exactly this molecule. All right, so this is this important molecule that we need to survive. And it has a chunk of RNA on it. All life on the planet exploits this molecule, or essentially all life, suggesting that this compound is very, very old. Probably was invented in the RNA world, is still used by modern cells today, and in some cases is sensed by an RNA molecule. All right, are there others? Well, here's some more RNAs. They fold into this shape. They bind that compound. That compound is called SAM. And SAM has this same chemical group on it. All right, again, it's, these are compounds that are essential for life on the planet. Here's another RNA. It binds a compound very similar to SAM called SAH. There's another RNA component. Here's another riboswitch. switch. Uh, by the way, this compound is a derivative of, of riboflavin. Again, in this bottle of pills here. And the whole thing is made from RNA. Here's another one. We call this compound MOCO, molybdenum cofactor, or MOCO. That thing is made from RNA. Uh, here's another one, tetrahydrofolate. This whole thing, this part here, is made from a nucleotide much like this, derived from RNA. All right, and in each case, there's a wonderful RNA structure that binds, in this case, that binds two of these molecules and turns gene expression on and off. Here's another one. This is a derivative. So when you're making these compounds, there are intermediates, and here's an RNA that binds one of those intermediates. Again, a bit, uh, a chunk of RNA, the RNA world. Uh, I like these in particular because many bacteria have the need to tell cells, tell their cells what to do at certain times. 
They have little signaling molecules. We call them second messengers. Right? So these little messenger molecules in many bacteria are made from RNA. This is just a little RNA. The whole thing is one chunk of RNA. And yet there are RNAs out there that sense them and turn genes on and off. All right, I can go on and on. I'm going to skip. Oh, I want to show you this one here. Again, this one is in this bottle of pills. This is a derivative of thiamine, the vitamin thiamine. And that top part is, is uh, made in the same way that you make these RNA molecules. Now, why I wanted to show you this one is because you can ask, okay, what, you know, these, what are these Yale scientists working on life that might have been around 4 billion years ago? Who cares about this stuff? All right, so we wanted to learn a little bit about where life came from. And sometimes you make advances in the lab that might help humans, might be useful for treating human disease. And so I want to show you this, this RNA, thiamine or thiamine pyrophosphate in this RNA. Okay, so when we first started discovering these RNAs, I would go to, 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 to audiences of scientists and I would say, okay, here's what we know. And then I would say, gee, I think these should make good targets for new medicines. So imagine that you had a, 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 a bacterial infection. And if that bacteria used this RNA to see that compound, to do important things, right? If you could trick that RNA, if you could make a compound that tricked this RNA into binding the, the, the drug, the, the, let's say it was an antibiotic, and not uh, the normal compound, then you could kill the cells and save the person who's infected. All right, so we, we thought that this was going to be a useful thing to do. But then I would get this question from other scientists. By the way, if, if you don't know this, scientists like to, to fight, argue with each other about all these kinds of ideas. And I would always get a scientist in the audience who would say, well, you know, come on, Dr. Breaker, if this is a good idea, if you could make antibiotics that hit these RNAs, you would know that some drug company would have already made a compound that would hit that RNA. And we'd be using these as, as um, treatments for humans already. And I would say, yeah, you know, I know you're right, um, but it sure makes sense to us that there should be, uh, you should be able to, to trick these RNAs and save people. And um, we now know that, in fact, scientists had encountered compounds that hit these uh, uh, RNAs. Um, and, in fact, I'll just jump to one of them here. So this is the normal compound that this RNA binds. This one here is a compound called pyrothiamine. It was made in 1942, right? Right in the middle of World War II. And this compound, which is just a little different, right? This little center ring is different than the ring here. Okay, scientists knew that this killed bacteria all the way back to 1942, and they had no idea how it worked. Well, we now know that that compound sits right in here, this little uh, uh, purplish uh, um, structure here, right? And the phosphates are binding here. This ring structure on the left-hand side is binding on the right-hand side of this here. And then this center part is that ring right here. And the RNA doesn't care about the ring. It only binds the, the two sides. It doesn't care about the center. And we wouldn't have discovered these RNAs if we hadn't been thinking about how life began. All right, so can we find more? All right, are there more of these relics in our, hidden in our genomes, hidden in our DNA that we could I'm going to tell you just very briefly how we find them. So many of you will know that, that uh, DNA stores our, our, our genetic information. So there are genes in different places in our, in our genome, but sometimes there are gaps. There's a string of DNA that doesn't seem to do anything, right? Remember, this is this junk, this idea of junk DNA. Well, again, we don't think that there's a whole lot of junk in many uh, stretches of DNA, so we look in these regions. We look here in these gaps to try to find new RNAs that are, that uh, until this point are undiscovered. So, what do we need to do this? We need DNA sequence, we need Yale's supercomputer uh, capability, and out comes wonderful RNA structures and sequences that have functions that are completely unknown. And we want to figure out what they do. So let me show you some of these. Um, Sometimes we find things like this. Again, remember the red, the red letters are very conserved. We tend not to be interested in these because they, they appear to be binding to proteins. So, these, so if you're binding to proteins, chances are you might be a more recent 
evolutionary in, uh, invention. We want to find the things that might be very primitive. So we ignore those. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this because it is a riboswitch. It's one of the most interesting riboswitches we found. Now, in some cases, and I won't talk about this, but in some cases we find RNAs that are really big and we don't know what they do. So this is one of those that's really big. That RNA is big. I know it's big because I made this slide and I made it kind of tricky. That is a big RNA biology, right? So usually they're quite small. This thing is enormous. And we know that it's a very um, intricately folded RNA. So for those of you who know a little bit about how these RNAs might fold, we know things like this, like those two nucleotides here reach way over and interact with those two nucleotides way over here. And that's over and over again. These interact way down here by these. This RNA is folding into some giant RNA complex. And we have no idea what it does. All right. Now we figured out one of these other ones. We figured out this one. All right. So now you can play sort of budding um, uh, microbiologist here. Let's say I tell you, here's an RNA. We don't know what it does. We think it's a switch, but we don't know what it does. And if I told you that these are the 12 most common genes that are hanging around this RNA. Well, sometimes we say, all right, here's a mystery RNA, and here's a gene. And if we know what that gene codes for, you know, let's say that gene codes to make one of those vitamins. Well, then maybe the RNA senses that vitamin. Right? But here are some genes. And don't worry about the names because you know, we know a lot about this kind of stuff. We had no clue from those genes what that RNA was doing. We, we, just, we didn't know enough about those genes. We didn't know enough about um, uh, the, the possible molecules or ions that might be sensed by the RNA to tell. There's a question back here. Yes? What's I'm sorry. What's the chem? Uh, you mean of the of the big molecule, the vitamin B12, or of the, of this big RNA? Yeah. So that that molecule is made only of the four nucleotides. It has about 850 nucleotides, but they're just reusing this one and the other three that are from RNA. It's only made of RNA, right? It's just a big, it's about 850. That's an unusually large RNA um, com, you know, compared to what we find in modern cells. But it's only pure RNA. And then sometimes, in rare cases, happy accidents happen. We're testing ideas. Right? We've had some ideas about what it might, might do, or some really bad ideas about what it might do. And we were testing those ideas, and we found that. Um, there was a contamination in one of the chemicals we were testing. And that contamination triggered the RNA to switch. And that contamination is something that you guys probably use every day. Right? So this is toothpaste. All right? What do you guys know? Is it, what's the most famous thing in toothpaste? F I heard fluoride out there somewhere. Fluoride. Right? So the contamination in our sample was fluoride and that told us what the switch was working with. All right? So fluoride was a contamination and what we did then to prove that that RNA sensed fluoride was we put the RNA, so now we're doing a little genetic engineering, we put the RNA on a protein that turns blue when it's made. Right, so here's our RNA. We attach it to a region that'll code this, this fancy name thing. It just means that the protein's going to turn blue when it's made. And then we put those in cells and we add fluoride, sodium fluoride. This is no fluoride. The cells are not blue. And as we add more and more fluoride, the cells turn blue. All right, so this is a little genetic switch that binds fluoride, the ion fluoride. All right, now, you guys might not know this. Some of you might know what millimolar is. Just note that this 30 here, that 30 is about two to three times lower in concentration than the fluoride in your toothpaste. Okay, so this toothpaste could turn on that genetic switch. Right? When you brush, there are bacteria on your teeth that are saying, oh my God, there's a lot of fluoride. I'm turning on this switch. And the reason why it does it is that fluoride is toxic to most uh, cells. Okay? 
But I'm going to argue that fluoride has been around for a long time. It's been around since the formation of the Earth. And that biology has hated fluoride for a long time. But it has mechanisms, including things like that RNA switch, to sense fluoride and to overcome whatever toxic effects fluoride might have. Now I want to show you how this RNA does, oh, I have to prove that this is indeed what biology cares about. So we were doubting this. I mean, why would RNA want to bind? Why does biology care about it? And we found an organism, it has this crazy name, Methylobacterium extorquens. This bacterium has 10 of these RNAs when most cells only have one or maybe two of these RNAs. Right, so we knew there was going to be something that was going to be famous about this bug that told us what the real um, uh, compound or ligand was for this, for this uh, RNA. So this thing has 10, most have only one or, or two. So this microbe is famous. It's famous for eating compounds like this. Or compounds like this. Right? There's fluorine on here. So when these organisms are eating these organic compounds, and by the way, this organism was found at a chemical spill site. Right? So there was an industrial accident, chemicals were in the environment, and, and there were microbes there eating those nasty chemicals with chloride or with chlorine on or fluorine. And fluoride is toxic to cells. These microbes had figured out a way to sense fluoride and say, oops, I better stop eating because the more I eat, the more fluoride I release and the sicker I'm going to be. Okay, so we knew when we found this bug that indeed that was exactly what this thing was doing. Now I'm going to show you a picture of exactly how this RNA binds fluoride. So here's this crazy shaped RNA. I'll tell you right now that the red dot right here is fluoride. And the way this RNA captures fluoride is it builds a little magnesium cage. So magnesium is positively charged, fluoride is negative. So it builds a little positive charge cage and holds fluoride in the center. Okay, and I'll show you a blow up of the structure. Again, there's fluoride. Those three blue circles are magnesium. And those magnesiums are held together by phosphates. The little um, tail of this molecule, it's held together by these phosphates. Now. What I like about this is that this little part here reminds me a lot of this, fluorapatite. You can see this in the Peabody Museum. It's, a, it's one of these gemstones that you would see at the Peabody. This same material is the material that, that really forms the enamel on your teeth. And the reason why you brush with fluoride is you want to make that enamel as hard as you can to prevent bacteria from drilling holes in your teeth. But fluoride also inhibits the cells from growing. It stops the cells from growing. Okay, and that's why you brush, to harden your enamel, but also to slow those microbes down. And those microbes are, far, uh, they're fighting back with an RNA world um, contraption, this little riboswitch that senses fluoride and tells the cell, hey, you better turn on some genes to overcome fluoride toxicity. All right, now I'm gonna show you one last slide to tell you how close scientists are to really understanding the earliest days of the RNA world. So this is scientists' attempt to roll back the clock f uh, four billion years. All right, so remember the definition of life? A self-sustaining chemical process that is capable of replication and evolution. And I said that maybe a molecule, one molecule could do that. And that would be a molecule RNA that is able to fold up and make babies. It's got to fold up and reproduce. So RNA needs to make RNA. And that would be a living molecule. So how close are scientists to recreating something that probably went extinct three and a half or four billion years ago? All right, now this, and again, I apologize for all the letters and squiggles here, but this is a really special RNA here on the right hand side. That RNA molecule has the ability to fold up. It grabs two other RNAs. There's a little short RNA and here's a longer RNA. It grabs those two and it can start adding nucleotides on the end. It can grow that third RNA, that, this top RNA. It can grow it in size. And the way it grows it is it uses this other RNA 
to tell it what nucleotides to add. In other words, it's, it has the ability to transfer information from one RNA to another. It can copy it, make it longer, and that's the act of reproducing if you're an RNA molecule. All right, so how good is that RNA? So here, this one, this one might make you go blind if you look at it too long here, but let me tell you what's going on. That little RNA is this little blob right here. And this, this is a, a method, it's a scientific method by which we can separate RNA molecules based on size. So really short RNAs are at the bottom and really long RNAs are way at the top. All right, so what this RNA is doing is it's grabbing this, it's adding nucleotides all the way along here. And what is there? There's, there's three, six, nine, there's 11 nucleotides here. And if you look here, this RNA is going to be, be made longer by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and maybe 11 right there. All right, so this RNA can extend another RNA by about 11 nucleotides. Now, if you give it two of these sequences, so you have this one and another one that's not shown here, if it has two of those sequences, then you go 22 nucleotides. If you give it three, it goes up by about 33 nucleotides. Four, five, six, et cetera, all the way up. You can see there's big, long RNAs being made here. There's over 200 nucleotides that this RNA can add to another RNA. All right, 200 nucleotides is more than the size of the RNA that's making RNA. In other words, this is an RNA that has the ability to make other RNAs as long as it is, or even longer. If scientists can only teach that RNA how to make copies of itself, you will have the reinvention of a living molecule probably for the first time in four billion years. That day will happen. It will probably happen soon. We will all be alive when that happens because I think it's going to happen that soon. And that's, again, a really special moment because you can think about what might have happened four billion years ago. You can collect evidence for it in cells like ours. And then you can devise experiments to recreate what might have happened that long ago. Okay? So I think that there's a, a, a sort of very exciting times for us because we can, we can sort of peer back and see what might have happened uh, billions of years ago. But in some ways, we can also exploit our new knowledge to create things like new medicines, new antibiotics. Um, I'm going to end there and just show you a picture of the faces that actually do this work. I want you guys to know, I won't name names here, but I want you to know that the people who do work, like what I described, are closer to your age than they are to, to my age. Very young people are doing science that I think is very important um, uh, to understand how biology works, where it came from, and where we're taking it into the future.